good evening. If you're here in Hong Kong, good morning. If you're joining us from the US or good day, if you're joining us anywhere in the YouTube universe and watching this later, uh, very excited to be here at the FCC. I'm Keith Richburg. I'm the president of the FCC. And before I introduce our guest, who's a great friend of mine, I wanted to let you know that please keep in touch with us on FCCHK.org for all of our upcoming events. Uh, we've got one coming up on Tuesday at breakfast. If you want to do something while you're having your coffee, that's Tuesday, March 23rd at breakfast, 8 a.m. Hong Kong time. So that would be Monday evening uh, US time. Uh, we're gonna have Tuping Chen from the Wall Street Journal. She's a Wall Street Journal correspondent, but she uh, lives the dream that we all dream, which she's also a novelist and a writer. And she's written a book called Land of Big Numbers. And we're gonna have conversation, a breakfast conversation with Tuping Chen, Land of Big Numbers coming up uh, this coming Tuesday. But I am very excited for tonight's talk. We've got, uh, Bei Fang, who's president of Radio Free Asia, who's joining us from Washington, D.C. Uh, for the last 25 years, if you're not familiar with Radio Free Asia, uh, it's been broadcasting and publishing online news and commentary to countries all around the Asia Pacific region where authoritarian governments have been blocking uh, real information. Uh, you know, publicly funded broadcasters worldwide are now being challenged by governments that chafe at the idea of having public broadcasters. And they're also in the countries in which they work having to deal with this whole kind of uh, fire hose of fake news coming out. So uh, Bei Fong is gonna talk to us today about the challenges of covering this region. Uh, Bei Fong, president of Radio Free Asia. Uh, she's overseen award-winning journalism for Radio Free Asia. She's a former Beijing bureau chief for US News and World Report. She covered Afghanistan and Iraq. I think we were in Hojabaudin together, if I'm not mistaken, which is up yeah. on the Tajikistan border. Uh, she's had the added expect, uh, perspective of having once been in government for a very brief time during the Obama administration as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Press and Public Diplomacy. Uh, she's a graduate of Harvard University, uh, was a visiting fellow at Oxford, a uh, Fulbright uh, scholar in Hong Kong. She's, got, she's been basically everywhere. And she also trained as a chef at the Cordon Bleu in Paris and holds a brown belt in Kung Fu. So when she's walking home at night in Washington, don't mess with her. And as I remember from Adams Morgan, she also has an addiction to ice cream and pie. I'm not sure if Maggie Moos is still there. And full disclosure, uh, Bei Fong is actually a friend of mine. We've known each other very well since at least 2005. And full disclosure, I sometimes have served as the outside independent external evaluator for Radio Free Asia. So Bei, welcome to the FCC in Hong Kong. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Do us one favor before we get started. Could you please make us a promise that when we can all travel again, you'll come and visit us in person? Uh, I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We can't wait either. But uh, thank you for just being us. Let's just start off because for people who may not be familiar with RFA, Radio Free Asia, what is Radio Free Asia? What is it? What do you do? Where do you broadcast? What is it? So to start off, we are a uh, we're a private nonprofit. We receive our funding from the U.S. Congress, um, so we are basically a grantee of the U.S. government. Uh, but we are not an agency of government like like Voice of America. But we we all we fall under um, the U.S. Agency for Global Media. Um, we get our money from through them, um, and uh, we were set up basically after Tiananmen uh, Square. After, after that happened. Um, we, uh, the idea was that um, uh, the US stands for freedom of the press um, and we wanted to be able to broadcast like, like uh, um, we do with Radio Free Europe, um, broadcasting into uh, sort of the former Soviet bloc and beyond. Um, uh, Radio Free Asia was set up to broadcast into countries in Asia that don't have free press. And so the idea was just that um, the US stands for freedom of the press. We want to model a free, um, unbiased, uncensored journalism um, to those countries. And we want to serve as surrogate media. So uh, to give the citizens of those countries um, access to, um, to uh, real trustworthy media that they wouldn't otherwise get. Um, so we, we uh, we broadcast in um, nine different languages. Um, so just into China, we broadcast in Mandarin, Cantonese, Tibetan, and Uyghur. We have the world's mm -hmm. only uh, international Uyghur um, news service. Um, 
And then uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, we broadcast in Burmese, um, Cambodia, uh, Khmer into Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnamese. And of course, we broadcast in Korean into North Korea. Um, so mm. that's that's the idea of, of Radio Free Asia. Um, I think a lot mm. of people think, you know, they ask, are we actually uh, broadcasting? You know, are we propagandists, basically? Mm. Um, and the, the 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 very clear answer is no. Um, we're not actually. Um, uh, politically influenced in any way, we we have a strict firewall that goes, um, you know, that that basically stands between um, uh, any government or political interference mm. in our mm. um, our editorial mm. uh, reporting mm. and editorial line. Mm. So we're not sending any message um, mm. through our content, but rather just through um, mm. uh, what we stand for in being mm. a, a free mm. press. Um, uh, in, in these countries. That, that's really important, what, the, what you just said. Can you elaborate on that? What's the difference between journalism and propaganda? <laughs> well, propaganda, I mean, so basically, um, an example would be, you know, so we have really, um, uh, you know, sort of hard-hitting, incisive journalism in, in all of our uh, our languages in all of our countries. Um, we expose, in, in, for example, in uh, in Vietnam, we expose a lot of um, corruption uh, uh, that's being perpetrated by uh, local and uh, um, and um, you know uh, uh, higher government officials. Um, uh, if uh, President Biden were to do a trip to uh, to uh, Vietnam, for example, uh -huh. and uh, decided that he wanted to, um, you know, warm relations with that country, um, that would not have one bit of uh, of uh, impact on our reporting mm -hmm. at all. I mean, it would, um, you know, there should there would be no difference in uh, what we what our reporters covered, um, and uh, you know what you know there, there would be no there's no message in uh what mm. we're trying to cover rap, uh, aside mm. from just um mm. you know speaking truth to power the way um you know most independent journalists try to do it, interesting and 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 again what's the difference between rfa and for example the other u.s funded broadcasters like uh, voice of america or government funded broadcasters like bbc or dpa or even uh i should say rthk here in hong kong yeah, well, all of those um, have slightly uh, sort of uh, different um, missions and uh, um, and uh, sort of perspectives. I think um, mm -hmm. VOA uh, their mission is is to actually you know part of their mission is to tell the American story. Um, so um, you know we we work very closely with them. They're a sister organization, um, and they are a federal agency, unlike us. Um, but uh, um, you know, but but their mission is very different from ours as a surrogate broadcaster. Um, they they are actually allowed to have a bureau in China, and that's partly because oh. um, you know they uh, their coverage is not um, seen to be as um, you know sort of hard hitting against the the, the Chinese government. Um, uh, the you know, for example, so in um, we we coordinated on a, a video project that we uh, broadcast in Korean um, uh, oh. jointly, uh, um, RFA and, and VOA, and um, RFA's project involved um, finding these young defectors in South Korea and basically right. creating a reality show about um, their lives and uh, their their new lives in Seoul and. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, and sort of, you know, just actually following them as they uh, discovered things about about the city. I mean, one of the defectors mm -hmm. I spoke to, this young woman, um, discovered that there were makeup tutorials on YouTube, and that was, you know, this this obviously this huge revelation because uh, mm -hmm. she had never had access to that kind of thing when she was in the north. Um, so uh, you know, sort of, it's things like that. One of the defectors, you mm -hmm. know, decided her, his dream was to set up a food cart, and so we followed mm -hmm. him, um, mm -hmm. sort of wow. through his his journey in uh, 
um, in you know sort of the, the South Korean bureaucracy and uh, and and basically realizing this this dream. Um, uh, the VOA um, sort of side of this uh, this project was to tell a story of a neighborhood called the Palisades in New York, which was um, mm -hmm. sorry, New Jersey, which is uh, is very heavily Korean American. So it's uh, it was mm -hmm. actually telling the story of the Korean American experience. So that's just an mm -hmm. example of of sort of how different our uh, our uh, missions and perspectives are. All right, and and how how big is your staff? I mean, we keep hearing about news organizations cutting staff and not covering foreign news, but your correspondents are all in the countries that you cover. I mean, how how big is it? <laughs> so the correction, they're not actually, a lot of them are not in the countries that they cover, but we do have uh, bureaus in several countries in, in the region. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, so we have um, about 270 uh, staff in um, in uh, DC um, mm -hmm. and in uh, and we have contractors. We have uh, about 450 mm -hmm. contractors um, around the oh. world. So we have um, uh, and in DC, but um, but we have uh, bureaus in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, as you know well. Mm -hmm. um, we until uh, a couple of years ago, we had um, a bureau in uh, Phnom Penh, uh, Cambodia, mm -hmm. and um, and we have uh, two bureaus and, and people around the country in Burma. We actually have quite a robust mm -hmm. presence in mm -hmm. uh, in Myanmar. Um, so. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, but we're not allowed in, in several other countries, mm -hmm. North Korea, obviously, that, China, um, Laos, mm -hmm. Vietnam. That's a pretty large uh, news gathering operation then, considering you're concentrated on a few countries and you've got, you know, a few hundred people. That's a lot. Yeah, Th those, uh, those numbers are actually including technicians and, uh, you know, administrative staff. It's not just editorial staff, but, mm -hmm. uh, but yes, it is, it is quite mm -hmm. a few. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and and we're headquartered in DC, and a lot of our reporting does come out of DC. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, you know, it, it's it is definitely a challenge not being allowed in in the countries. We're always trying to find ways to, especially with um, investigative reporting, to find stories that people haven't done before that we can do um, in mm -hmm. you know third countries. So, for example, um, uh, mm -hmm. we. Uh, did an investigative uh, piece that was sort of focused on how North Korea was was um, skirting the sanctions to get hard currency into the country uh, by sending workers overseas. So we we mm. were one of the first to sort of report um, in depth about um, these North Korean workers who you know for example were, were mm. building the uh, the soccer stadium in Qatar. Um, there were there were a bunch of North Korean doctors who had been sent to Tanzania to set up uh, medical clinics. Um, so uh, so. You know, we had people go to these places um, to, uh, you know, to actually hang out with these people and and kind of get the inside scoop on on um, mm -hmm. what their lives were like. Um, you know, how they had to send the money uh, back. I mean, these were basically like indentured servants who uh, were working for oh. um, mm -hmm. for the purpose of getting uh, hard currency back to uh, the the, um, mm -hmm. the regime. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that I'm supposed to say congratulations. It's your 25th anniversary of Radio Free Asia. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> 25 years. Now, 25 years ago, I don't think I've ever sent, I had sent my first email 25 years ago. I don't think I <laughs> know, knew what Facebook was. Uh, I don't think I knew what Twitter was 25 years ago. How has RFA adopted to this new internet age? And let me couple that with an, an, another question, which is, I mean, these days, everybody has a VPN, even in authoritarian countries, they can go directly to WashingtonPost.com, NewYorkTimes.com. So how have you managed to stay relevant? How has RFA stayed relevant in this new internet age? That's a very good question. Yeah, I mean, our first broadcasts we, um, into into China with our our, our one uh, service at the time, the Mandarin service, was was mostly focused on shortwave. Um, and we we definitely still have a, a shortwave presence, and we we find it very important, especially um, when we've seen examples of uh, you know when when the government actually has has when 
different authoritarian governments have actually been able to shut down the internet for periods at a time. Um, mm -hmm. For example, um, sort of early in the, uh, um, uh, you know, during uh, when, when coronavirus first came out of Wuhan, we actually saw a surge mm -hmm. in um, shortwave usage in trying to get um, to our mm -hmm. broadcasts out of Wuhan, actually. Um, oh. So, um, but, uh, but, you know, there are several, you know, there are many different ways we have adapted to the modern environment, um, you know, people can can reach us on uh, medium wave on satellite um, and on the internet we have a very robust presence um, uh, you know but but more than that I think I mean we we um, you know we try to uh, be very engaged on social media platforms um, uh, we actually have different, uh, you know, in our Mandarin service, um, each talk show host has a different um, sort of WeChat group with with audience mm. members and um, actually get a lot of tips that way. Um, mm. There, um, uh, we, we've we actually just recently, um, and we have yet to do a hard launch of this, but there's mm. a, um, a new uh, sort of a new brand um, within mm. the Radio Free Asia Mandarin service called Why mm. Not. So in, in English, it's Why, why not? not. In, in Chinese, not? it's, yeah, why not? You know, I mean, the idea <laughs> is to reach um, the post Tiananmen generation who uh, of, of Chinese and other Mandarin speakers around the world who, mm. um, you know, may not have had, uh, you know, given how much uh, the, the Chinese government is putting into control of Mandarin media around the world. Um, many of these mm. um, young Chinese um, have not had the opportunity um, to to mm. to get uh, uh, you know that much exposure to to other mm. perspectives. So the idea is, you know, why not? And then uh, in Chinese, it's actually why no? You know, sort of like. Why a slanted no? perspective, uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, now meaning brain. So it's sort of instead mm. of brainwashing, we're actually just giving <laughs> you a different perspective for your brain. So, um, uh, so and and it's it's been um, you know sort of amazing uh, you know the amount that uh, uh, of um, of you know interest that we've gotten in this, even without doing a hard launch of mm. of the um, the mm -hmm. service. Um, it's all digital. Yeah all online um, and you know they've done so, some things like um, they've created the first kind of animated uh, series that is a political satire so um, you oh. know we our staff wrote it all themselves they actually voiced it all themselves but um, and they actually outsourced the uh, animation to a Taiwanese um, uh, company because mm -hmm. we don't have that ability in-house but um, but it's it's really amazing I really I, the idea is um, so it's called the extraordinary family um, and it's based on the idea of uh, you know sort of the Incredibles, where there's a family that um, mm -hmm. they they all live on a, a sort of a, 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 a mm -hmm. complex that that's owned by um, mm -hmm. a, a company, and everyone has superpowers, but they're kind of like. Um, not very useful superpowers like you know one, one person sort of involuntarily uh you know uh goes silent when speaking a censored term or whatever so it's it's uh you know th there are all sorts of uh kind of funny um uh sort of experiences that they go through it sounds like jumanji on that <laughs> so, so what tell me what i mean how on a serious note though how dangerous is, is it for your journalist out in the field i mean they're in places you mentioned cambodia they're now in myanmar uh you've yeah. done amazing award-winning reporting from xinjiang uh, i mean how, how dangerous is it for an rfa journalist out there in the field um, it it can be very dangerous. Um, we're actually in the process right now of uh, figuring out um, how to help our our journalists in Myanmar. Uh, many of them are in hiding. We have um, tried to refrain from uh, using bylines um, in in you know recent weeks. Uh, we you know we've been kind of anchoring the uh, the coverage out of DC, but um, obviously mm. with reporting on the ground done by these fearless mm -hmm. journalists. Um, um, you know, we, we got an, some amazing kudos um, from, um, from audience members when uh, our reporter A. Man, um, who's in Nepida, uh, covered the first uh, sort of um, press conference that the military spokesman held um, after the coup um, and asked a series of really hard hitting questions. Um, and we were actually surprised that she wasn't um, targeted afterwards um but uh yeah. but we you know she she's definitely uh you know um sort of 
lying low for the time being, but um, but um, the fact that that we were able to, uh, you know, we got a, an invitation to the press conference, we went and um, sort of and covered it. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, the amount of the outpouring of support we, and, you know, sort of, uh, mm. um, admiration that we got, um, afterwards was, uh, was mm. pretty amazing. Cause you know, this is all stuff that is done in, yes. um, in language. And these are people who, who live mm -hmm. in the country, whose families live in the country. Uh, and are you, are we uh, staying on Myanmar? And then again, this was a question that our uh, Washington Post colleague, Shabani Matani asked. Uh, are, you, are we going back to a situation where we're going to have to interview people outside of Myanmar and exiles to know what's going on in the country? Is it going to be too dangerous from or impossible to report accurately from within? Or how are we going to navigate that? I very much hope not. Um, I, I, um, uh, you know, I think we, we will get to a point, I mean, we would never, um, you know, force people to stay in the country and report for mm -hmm. us if they didn't want to. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so far in sort of taking, you know, sort of temperature checks of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the people um, who work for us in the country, you know, the vast majority want to continue their work. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's been pretty amazing. Um, so, uh, so, you know, we're, we're obviously, uh, you know, staying in close touch with them, and um, uh, but you mm -hmm. know, the, the last resort is is to mm -hmm. you know close up our operations and uh, and move to a third mm -hmm. country, um, and and mm -hmm. we we certainly hope we don't have to do that. Sure, and let me ask you about a couple other places that some members had asked about, and everybody's interested in. I mean, you've won awards for your reporting out of Xinjiang, and also you do yeah. some of the only reporting out of North Korea. So talk about the yeah. challenges of reporting from those two particular places. Let's start with North Korea. I mean, I see RFA reports out of North Korea and I'm thinking, how do you get this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's, it, it is tough. Um, we, um, you know, we have, so basically authentic really matters like the people who we um, have working for us we have defectors um, on staff and uh, and we just have people who sort of know how to operate in um, in uh, in talking to sources on, in the country but you know they know um, when they call someone they know they can only talk for a couple of minutes um, before uh, you know they, they uh, the call might be tapped and uh, and could get the, the person in trouble um, mm -hmm. they so they basically have just been able to cultivate um, sources uh, around the country to get um, to get news out of there. Um, you know, we also obviously tap into. We have a bureau in Seoul. I don't know if I mentioned that, but um, uh, mm -hmm. so you know, the people there um, are also very much involved in um, mm -hmm. in you know, sort of uh, um, uh, getting uh, maintaining um, sort of sources within the country, um, and um, and so uh, yeah, it's uh, it. it it's definitely a challenge. I mean, you know, you also spoke about our Uyghur reporters, and, and I should mention, um, sort of, with regard to, to your last question, um, you know, six of our Uyghur reporters still have their families in um, in Xinjiang uh, detained in these camps, and that was actually early on before they were detaining, sort of, you oh. know, over you know, millions of, uh, oh. of of Uyghurs. They were. Um, you know, specifically targeting uh, relatives of our reporters because, um, and they they said very openly that it was because um, because of the reporting that you know their son or daughter was or oh. you know or brother was was doing in the U.S. Um, for for RFA's Uyghur service. So. Um, mm. So yeah, with our with our Uyghur reporters, um, it's interesting. Vice News actually did a, a, a story um, just about you know kind of how our reporters work, um, uh, and um, and they followed uh, uh, one of our sort of star reporters, Shoret Hoshur, mm. who who makes mm. like hundreds of of just cold calls to police stations. Um, sometimes you know now that there's voice recognition, he uses a a, um, a sort of voice altering uh, software. Um, well, but often they they know who he is. He's actually you know been able yeah. to cultivate some kind of uh, you know sources yeah. within you know sort of local uh, um, mm -hmm. police departments around Xinjiang. Um, but often it just takes you know a lot of cold calling to get to someone who will speak to him. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and he he gets you know like you know we were the ones as you guys know um, who uh, sort of uh, kind of 
broke the story about the uh, the detention mm -hmm. camps and um, and uh, you know the conditions inside and and basically mm -hmm. this um, this campaign of genocide that the uh, the CCP has been waging against. Um, against mm. the weaker population. Um, but uh, but a lot of this just comes from, you know, kind of, sh you know, shoe leather journalism where, uh, um, you know, Chorette actually got a tip um, at one point by mm. um, looking at, uh, listening to, you know, sort of official uh, broadcast, like, you know, sort of uh, government broadcasts in um, in Xinjiang. And he, she, he was wondering why suddenly there were all these broadcasts about, you know, be careful of your children, take good care of them, keep them close. Mm -hmm. And he found out that there was a spate of like drownings. And, you know, there was one boy who was uh, a five-year-old who was found frozen to death in a snowbank. And it was because their parents were, there were now orphans essentially because their parents had been picked up and put into yes. those detention camps. And so, you know, often if they were being taken care of by an elderly, um, uh, you know, grandparent, they, um, you know, they weren't supervised as well as they should have been. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's a, a huge story that um, sort of tell, goes to the heart of what this actually means for families um, mm -hmm. in that region. Um, and, uh, and, you know, he got it from, mm -hmm. from hearing this, this basically a, a public service announcement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing bravery. And and your reporters are not uh, afraid to put their names on stories or to have their 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 name and voice associated with stories. Yeah, I mean, some of them are using pseudonyms, um, and uh, but uh, but for the most part, I mean, you know, if you listen to our Uyghur reporters, for example, talk about it, I mean, they're they're just like someone has to do it, and uh, um, mm -hmm. you know, we we would rather you know sort of make mm -hmm. the sacrifice of ourselves and our families mm -hmm. in this case, um, uh, um, then not have these voices be heard, mm -hmm. not have these yeah. stories be told. That's fascinating. And uh, apparently you recently wrote an article that I have not seen, but I'm told it was on LinkedIn about the safety of journalists and specifically about women journalists in the field. And we've yeah. done a lot here at the FCC talking about the harassment of women journalists online. Do you think it's yeah. less safe for women journalists? than it is for others? I mean, I uh, I think the short answer is yes. Um, I mean, I think uh, there are a lot of different forms that uh, harassment can take and um, sort of online harassment and uh, um, and abuse is, is only the most, um, you know, uh, the most recent sort of uh, um, form that uh, that that it's taken, but but I do think that um, women um, are running a lot more risks. Um, in you know, I think that there is sort of the the uh, the double risk of being a journalist in some of these countries and and being a woman. Um, so um, uh, so yes, I, I do think we have to be. Um, we have to put in. We have to be responsible as as media managers um, to um, put in place um, sort of safeguards and uh, to be especially vigilant uh, and and you know to 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 give the appropriate training um, to our our both our female and our male journalists, but to to make people aware that this is an issue and uh, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and you know to to uh, mm -hmm. to protect them. Sure. Do you, and I'm just curious, do you have new people who want to come and work for RFA and join RFA? Or do you have people saying, I can't work here anymore, it's too dangerous? I mean, which way is it? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, as as I mentioned, you know, even with with uh, you know our people uh, in um, in crisis right now in in Myanmar, people still don't want to leave us. I mean, we're giving them the option. We we are trying to take care of them um, and uh, um, you know um, give them options for either leaving RFA uh, um, and helping them. You know, once they do, um, and or you know leaving the country and and also you know we're trying to assist them with mm -hmm. that. Um, but uh, but very few are, are taking that um, option. I just think for a place like RFA um, to come here, you really have to believe in the mission, um, and mm -hmm. uh, and so it's um, you know in some way it's unlike many other uh, media organizations, which I think you know I. Um, you know, I think uh, there there is a lot of sort of um, 
unbiased free media out there, but I think um, with our particular mission, it's uh, it is unique. And and can I ask you a question about there was some uh, there was new there were news reports earlier that under the Trump administration, uh, Chinese journalists in the U.S. who were working for agencies, uh, including American agencies like VOA and perhaps uh, RFA would not be having their visas extended for long periods of time, et cetera. Were, you, were your staff in Washington impacted by that at all? You're talking about the J-1 visa issue under exactly. Michael Pack? Exactly. And I'm going to talk to yeah, you about Michael so... Pack in a minute. <laughs> talk about the visas first. Right, right, right. Um, so, uh, uh, so actually, Actually, our RFA, we were not that um, impacted. We actually don't have that many journalists under J-1 visas. Um, I know at, at VOA, um, you know, it was heartbreaking because people, you know, were, were not having their, their uh, visas extended and were actually being sent back to these countries that in many cases they mm -hmm. left, you know, years before exactly. um, yeah. under, you know, difficult circumstances. Um, so, um, so, you know, this was actually part of a, a lawsuit that was launched against Michael Pack um you know uh, basically citing um, violations of the firewall because the idea was that uh the fact that he was um you know personally uh signing off or in this case not signing off on visa renewals um mm -hmm. that he was actually you know basically able to change editorial uh um uh he was actually in, able to interfere in in um in editorial functions um f because of that that um sort of uh measure of control um so uh so you know that was one of the things that um that you know, people thought was was improper and speaking of michael back uh, you you bay you are the, you are the comeback kid <laughs> people were here were reading about how uh, you were subject to this kind of purge of various I don't know, uh, media entities there and uh, you've done a remarkable comeback and now you're back at the helm again we're all glad to see you back uh, but uh, can you talk a little bit about give us a little bit of the background what what happened w you know what were you thinking during this hiatus period uh, what were you doing were you kind of biding your time and praying for a new administration to come in and then and, and now that you're back i mean how, how are you going to guarantee the editorial independence of rfa yeah that's great questions um so uh yeah, yeah i mean basically when when michael pack uh came in uh last june um you know we were all kind of crossing our fingers and hoping for the best um i uh you know basically you know went ahead he he, he sort of never reached out to any of us i we didn't even have his email um, uh, sort of for the first couple of weeks he was there. Um, I sent him a, a briefing book as he would to a new CEO. Um, and, uh, um, you know, basically everything he, he needed to know about RFA that our staff had, had put together. And, um, and, you know, I sent it to the deputy chief of staff whose email was the only one I had and, uh, you know, got back a, a email saying, thank you for this. And, um, and then, you know, a couple of days later, it was, you know, the so-called Wednesday night massacre when uh, he just summarily fired um, all of the entity heads um, of, of the media organizations that that uh, that he oversaw as CEO of uh, the U.S. Agency for Global Media, and so, um, you know, so and most of us had never met him before, and um, you know, as, as you, I said, you were fired by somebody you never met. He fired you, totally, and he never met. Yeah. You. Yep. 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 Um, and, uh, um, and so, uh, you know, it was, it was, a, a, a pretty, um, amazing experience. Um, I, <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, so I actually had, it, it was it, sort of, I think it, last year was a, a strange year for many people, um, uh, you know, because of, <laughs> uh, the spread of COVID, uh, the shutdown in, in, uh, in most of the world. Um, so I actually have, um, a, uh, um, two young children. I have a, a four-year-old and, uh, uh, now 17 month old. Um, and so at the time, you know, I, I just sort of reoriented and said, okay, I'm going to, you know, it's, it, it has, it was a difficult, uh, enough period because, you know, they weren't in school and it was, uh, um, and, you know, we were both working from home. And so I just said, okay, I'm just going to focus on, um, on spending time with them. And, uh, um, and, uh, you know, it, so 
there was a lot to do still um, because um, you know there were uh, there was a lot of interest, uh, understandably, in um, in Congress, and um, you know there was. Uh, you know, there were different uh, um, sort of legal challenges that were going on. And, uh, um, but, you know, sort of, it, it was one of these things where it, it just kind of kept getting worse in, inside. And so at, at some point I was like, well, I'm glad I'm out at this point um, because who knows what, what his next move will be. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and I have to say it was, you know, I think we we hoped that once um, the Biden administration came in and a new CEO was was announced, um, that there would be some changes. Um, I didn't quite expect it to happen so quickly. <laughs> um, I was saying, you know, I was saying to friends that you know, if I knew it was only going to be sort of a, a seven month uh, sabbatical, <laughs> I, I would have done a lot more. You know. Uh, <laughs> Say, I'll say holiday. this to you. I'll say like, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll do a lot more, you know, hikes, you know, day drinking. So, so, <laughs> so, so you, you, you did master classes and you worked on your Kung Fu and that kind of thing. During the hiatus. <laughs> <laughs> and so what, what happened? So, so Joe Biden, president now calls you and says, Bay, can you come back? I mean, how did that happen? <laughs> Not quite as sexy as that. No, um, it was, uh, I mean, basically, um, Michael Pack was asked to resign on Inauguration Day. Um, he, uh, you know, sent in his resignation and was out by two o'clock. Um, and uh -huh. uh, um, and then uh, Kalu Chow, who I've known for a long time, who um, uh, was the deputy director for programming at VOA and was actually the, the unnamed uh, um, Jane Doe journalist who jo joined in the, uh, the firewall lawsuit against Michael Pack um, and mm -hmm. you know, was, was one of the, the very brave people who was still inside the, the organization and uh, chose to take a stand. Um, uh, she was named acting CEO, and uh, and she made the decision um, to uh, bring back, um, uh, you know, myself and Jamie Fly as head of View of uh, Radio for Europe, um, and uh, um, yeah, and it was totally unexpected. It was that Friday after inauguration, a couple days after inauguration day, that um, um, that that she called me up and said you're back um, and uh, yeah and and you know there were some people I think um, you know who were who had uh, been kind of whispering in her ear that uh, you know maybe we should proceed more cautiously and just name them as as interim um, uh, heads of the networks um, and you know like maybe approach White House PPO and see if there are other names that they wanted to put forward and um, and, you know, the thing is, and she realized this, like, first of all, it's not, um, it, my position is not a political position. Um, and it, it was never meant to be, um, you know, I oversee a, a newsroom. Um, and, um, and, uh, you know, and so, so she, she said, you know, I, I don't think that that, that would be appropriate, and uh, and she said, and, and plus, I I don't want these news organizations to have to, um, you know, sort of while their time any longer without a permanent head, um, mm -hmm. and uh, um, and so to her credit, she she just made this decision. And, That's and, great. And, so what happened to yeah. all those master classes that you signed up for because you thought <laughs> you had all this time? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think I think your subscription will last for a year, so you can go back to them at some point. But the <laughs> other other publicly funded uh, broadcasters have been having the same thing. We you know the you know every once in a while the BBC gets criticized because the government in power doesn't like their reporting. And uh, I don't know if you've been following it or not, but here in RTHK, the editor in chief left early. She we will not say fired. Uh, left early. Mm -hmm. And they put in a new uh, editor in chief, Mr. Patrick Lee, who I'm sure is a smart guy, but he's never been a journalist before. And he's suddenly come in and said, oh, we're gonna cancel all these programs because they're not balanced. Uh, coming from someone who's been a professional bureaucrat and has never been a journalist as far as I know. I mean, you may not be familiar with the specifics of RTHK, but I mean, what advice would you give to the journalists who are working in the newsrooms and all of a sudden, you know, there's a new guy in charge who's telling them, or here's how you want to do things. You're, this story is not balanced. We're going to cancel this program because we don't like the fact that Emily Lau is being quoted on it. I mean, what do you, <laughs> what do you talk, you know, what, uh, what would you say to people who are in that circumstance now and trying to do good, independent, yeah. solid journalism? 
I mean, it's a really difficult um, situation to be in. I, I think that's why um, when when RFA and, and the other media entities were were originally established, um, that uh, this concept of a firewall was was put in, and um, and that's really the importance of of the firewall legislation. Um, you know, the idea that there is this divide between um, uh, the government uh, and uh, sort of political uh, influence and and, um, and the the sort of uh, the people who oversee um, uh, the journalism that happens. Um, so um, as for the people in the uh, newsroom, I mean, it, it's 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 definitely difficult. Um, I think I would just say keep doing your jobs and keep um, you know hewing to the the sort of editorial integrity that you, um, you you believe in. Uh, I mean, this is what happened with uh, with the VOA reporter who has now been reinstated um, in her position, but she was covering the the, um, the White House and she uh, she did her job when uh, when Secretary of State Mike Pompeo at the time um, was uh, was invited to, yeah. to give a talk and she asked a question. Um, and uh, and she was slapped down by uh, you know Michael Pack's people and said you know that's inappropriate you were not um, uh, you were not authorized to speak and she was like I'm a reporter this is this is my job um, and so she was demoted uh, and uh, and then you know when Pack left uh, mm -hmm. she she came back in but you know I mean we one of the the reasons that the the firewall is so important especially for um a news organization like like voa or like rfa is because we're, we're publicly funded um and so you know the 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 um the obvious attack that we would get from a country like china or any authoritarian country that we broadcast into is um you know they're just doing the bidding of uh of you know the mm. the government that runs them. Um, they're not really telling you the truth about what's happening. Um, mm. You know around mm. you. Uh, um, so uh, you know why listen to them? Like listen to you know yeah. our our yeah. official yeah. news station. You know it's it's very interesting you mentioned that because here in Hong Kong there was a similar situation with an RTHK reporter who asked a tough question a very mm -hmm. toughly worded question of Carrie Lam, the chief executive. And all of a sudden she yeah. found herself put on extended probation because so many people yeah. complained that the question mm -hmm. was tough. It goes back to this whole idea that when you have a publicly funded broadcaster, there are some people who believe you should be not asking tough questions of the government or parroting the government line, or you should be promoting government policies, not asking these types of critical questions. And it, to me, it seems like it's almost a misunderstanding of what a publicly funded broadcaster is. It's not an arm of the government to promote government policies. Is that correct or? Yeah, completely. I mean, I think I've been saying this all along that, uh, you know, our job is not to do propaganda. Um, our job is to actually, um, you know, model what a free press can look like um, in countries that, that don't have it. And, um, and, you know, our belief is that an educated citizenry is actually um, good for democracy. Um, so I think that's the only kind of uh, value that goes into it. Um, but, uh, but there's absolutely no, um, uh, no propaganda that, that goes into any of our reporting. And let me ask you one personal question because it's pretty unusual for a journalist and I've known you as a journalist for you know, US News and World Report and you, you were Chicago Tribune, but you, you went to the dark side very briefly, you worked for the Obama <laughs> yes. administration. So you went, you went to the dark side, but then you came back. You worked as in the State Department for a while. I mean, tell me, why did you do that? What was that like? Is that, how did that affect your career? Was that a good thing to do or a bad thing to do? Yeah, I mean, I've actually never really had much of a plan uh, for my career. <laughs> um, not much of a career path. Uh, you know, I, I don't think uh, my my good, you know, Chinese American parents <laughs> ever really knew what <laughs> they'd sort of thrown up their hands uh, in despair about me. But um, uh, yeah, so when when I, you know, so to be honest, you know, the, the, the real answer is that um, I kind of fell into it. I um, uh, I, you know, was, um, was at the Chicago Tribune and, um, it was sold to, uh, the real estate mogul, Sam Zell and, uh, you know, being one of the, so I had been the diplomatic correspondent based in the Washington Bureau and they essentially closed most of the Washington Bureau. Um, mm -hmm. 
and uh, and so I was laid off, and uh, I um, you know was sort of casting about for what to do, and uh, and at the time the State Department was just starting this. Um, you know, the first kind of civilian surge into Afghanistan. And so I uh, took a job for a year um, as a, um, as a, 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 a uh, basically communications um, advisor. Um, and I was, uh, you know, so I lived in uh, in Kandahar on uh, this uh, NATO air base that was totally surreal. Um, and, uh, um, and then, um, and then, you know, sort of went from there to uh, to a, a journalism fellowship at Oxford that, uh, you know, they still allowed me to take. Um, and then mm -hmm. um, and then after that uh, was sort of trying to figure out what to do and actually um, uh, was approached uh, um, by someone that I had, you know, cold called about uh, um, mm -hmm. about uh, uh, speech writing, um, you know, sort of a couple of years uh, before that at, at, the, at the beginning of the Obama administration and that person was Ben Rhodes who at that point was um, deputy national security advisor and he um, uh, and so he sort of brought me into uh, the State Department um, uh, uh, to work for um, uh, for Phil Gordon who was the assistant secretary for uh, Europe and Eurasia at the time um, and um, and I uh, uh, was his um, deputy assistant secretary for press and public diplomacy. So, um, uh, so it was a, a really great experience. I mean, it was definitely, um, you know, sort of being thrown into the deep end in terms of uh, going mm -hmm. into this uh, bureaucracy. Um, uh, you know, after having been a, a foreign correspondent um, and not being in much sure, of a man. bureaucracy ever, right? Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, learning how to write emails with multiple people on the chain <laughs> in order of hierarchy. Um, but uh, yes. um, it, it but it was super, it was really eye opening. I, I, I felt like mm -hmm. um, it was something that uh, that should actually be sort of an instituted uh, exchange kind of between uh, people who work in government and, and people who mm -hmm. report on it, um, because uh, um, you know, I think um, as reporters, you um, you know, you're you often don't see what what has to go into kind of creating a strategy. I think it, in some ways it's easier to kind of stand on the outside and criticize um, <laughs> a strategy um, than to actually be inside and trying to create one. I mean, especially in the case of of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, but then at the same time, you know, I I thought. Uh, um, you know, there was a lot that uh, that people um, in in government fundamentally don't understand about journalists. I mean, one of the things that I said when I first um, went into the State mm -hmm. Department was, you know, when you're trying to decide whether to engage with a reporter, you should know that they're they're actually going to do the story, no matter whether or not you yeah. uh, engage with them. So, you know, if you talk to them, it's uh, um, it's just an opportunity to get your your uh, perspective heard um, and out there. So, uh, so that was, you know, <laughs> something that I think people fundamentally didn't didn't get um, in many ways. But um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so that that's sort of how it happened. And then, you know, now um, landing, at, I, I, I was so lucky to um, to uh, end up at at Radio Free Asia, where I've been for you know. On and off, I guess, um, for uh, about six years, um, you know, because it, it just uh, I, I I love being able to exercise both the sort of journalism part of um, mm -hmm. uh, of what I'm interested in and driven by, and then also uh, just having this this really important mission. Well, we're glad you're back on after your short hiatus, <laughs> but the fact that your master classes are going unused. Uh, we have one question coming in from uh, Emily Lau, former journalist, longtime FCC member, former member of the Legislative Council, good friend. And she say, she's asking, has RFA been subjected to pressure and influence from countries in Asia, including China? And have there been any complaints, for example, about staff not being able to report freely and independently? What kind of pressure uh, do you get? I mean, our pressure is 
basically, uh, you know, governments trying to cut off our broadcasts. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's more really, than pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and for example, as, as I have already mentioned, the Chinese government, you know, seizing our, our Uyghur reporters relatives, which is a really, you know, um, mm. uh, malevolent uh, kind of, mm. of pressure that they can exert, try to exert on our reporting um, unsuccessfully. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, with, uh, you know, we, we always have to be vigilant about, um, you know, which of our broadcasts is still being used, um, you know, still going through uh, and, you know, kind of changing it up um, um, uh, once in a while. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, um, it, it, we're we're lucky that we have devoted listeners who will will try to find us, um, <laughs> you know, no matter how difficult it is. In many cases, and what what are the most difficult places that your reporters are in now? I mean, is it reporting from China? Is it reporting from uh, North Korea? Or talk about Hong Kong? How difficult is it now from Hong Kong? Yeah, in Hong Kong, I mean, it's interesting because our Cantonese service is is our um, our smallest service. Um, we don't have many people working in it, um, but uh, um, and it was set up, um, you know, not necessarily to work from Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong was was actually, you know, just the the place with free press that uh, we thought we could operate from in covering, you know, the Cantonese speaking population in in China in mainland China. Um, little did we know at the time, 25 years or you know, 24 years ago, whenever the uh, Cantonese service was set up, um, that uh, that Hong Kong would become such a huge story um, in its own right. Um, and uh, you know, uh, so we have um, a, a bureau here um, of very brave reporters, actually both uh, uh, Mandarin and Cantonese um, service, um, and uh, and we've actually seen, like, especially you know. Uh, since 2019, a surge in um, in audience numbers, um, especially online on social media, um, um, it's uh, it's definitely you know got, as you guys know um, you know gotten more and more difficult uh, for us to report um, out out of Hong Kong. Um, you know, one one difference is that uh, you know our reporters are all Hong Kongers. You know, they they grew up there and uh, their families are, are there, um, you know, they're not there on a visa. Um, and it's, uh, so they, um, you know, they definitely have sort of different uh, uh, sort of things to think about in, in terms of, um, you know, the risks that they take. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think you guys know, you know, better than I, um, what, uh, what the, the situation is like in, in reporting out of Hong Kong these days. Yeah. And, and my, my colleague and friend and our vice president, Eric Wishart, is saying basically we have a lot of young journalists in Hong Kong, many of whom come through HKU mm -hmm. journalism, where I teach. And how, do, how can yeah. they join RFA? What if they want to work for you? <laughs> <laughs> what do they do? Send me an email. <laughs> no. Send um, an email. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, I mean, we, you know, we, we are um, often looking for, uh, for uh, talent, um, but, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, I'm glad that people are interested, you know, not only in RFA, but in journalism. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think it's, I remember, you know, having a long conversation with you, Keith, when you first started that position, um, you know, just how amazing some of the young people you were meeting. Um, were you know like coming from from the mainland and and being um, interested in in making a difference and you know it, uh, actually um, uh, you know like becoming a journalist in a place where journalism is is uh, um, is not a you know considered a a, um, a, a really prestigious uh, um, you know, and certainly not a, a wealth-making <laughs> job um, in a place like like mainland China is right. um, pretty impressive. Um, so uh, yeah, so I applaud all of these young people who um, um, who have come through your program and who uh, might be interested in coming to work for us. So um, 
so uh, yeah, certainly, um, you know, we'd love to find out more about you. Well, well, RFA is now 25 years old. In 25 years from now, your your kids will be out of college and off the payroll, including the 17 month old. <laughs> You and I will be sitting on a beach somewhere sipping pina coladas, but tell me what, <laughs> in your view, is the next 25 years for Radio Free Asia? What, how is it going to stay relevant? Where are you, are you expanding the new countries? Tell me, look in your crystal ball. Oh, man, it is so hard to know what uh, what the next 25 years might bring. Um, but, you know, who would have thought when they were sitting there um, in 1996 when the first broadcast uh, went out to mainland China um, on shortwave, um, you know, what what these past 25 years uh have brought. I mean, you know, when you look at China today um, and, you know, the enormous influence it wields over, um, you know, all different countries and, you know, the, um, you know, the, uh, the amount of, of uh, money and influence um, they put into controlling uh, media all over the world. Um, I mean, you know, I think one of the biggest things is not just about, you um, you know the means by which we we uh, we reach people, but um, but you know the fact of you know the rise of authoritarianism around the world today, and how um, important it is that we actually exist to try to counter um, the narratives that they, they throw out there. Um, um, you know, so I, I think. Uh, I think in the next 25 years, um, we have to look um, not only at, uh, you know, um, all these different sort of proliferating platforms and uh, and how to uh, be relevant and um, and reach our audience through that, um, but also um, at uh, putting resources towards um, a, a mission that is actually becoming, um, you know, uh, more and more uh, important by the day, I believe. Um, so um, uh, I don't know how satisfactory of an answer that is, but um, <laughs> I think um, you know we can just do our best with um, with uh, you know the mission of of uh, sort of bringing free press. I, I um, you know I've definitely been looking at uh, ways to uh, do um, more multimedia work, um, not just with this animated series, but um, with uh, ways of uh, kind of reaching a, a younger audience. Um, and, um, you know, we brought in a new creative director who's been doing amazing stuff um, and sort of pairing his talents with those of our journalists, I think, um, just mean that we're, we're able to reach that many more people. Um, um, so, uh, so, you know, it's, it's sort of one step at a time here. I don't think I'm going to try to make any huge pronouncements on, uh, um, on, you know, where we might, uh, um, go in the next 25 years, but I do know that, um, uh, in terms of fulfilling our, our mission and, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, right now is um it's kind of it's sort of the most uh crucial time that that i've seen so well um, thank you. hopefully you'll be there in the next 25 years and you'll come back yeah. and us again at the fcc be, uh before you let, <laughs> I let you go uh tell our members what books are you reading or have you read recently that you can recommend <laughs> <laughs> oh man, with uh, with these two little kids, I'm not doing much reading of books, at least, um, except for I guess um, uh, you know my four year old is uh, is really into dragons recently, and oh. so. <laughs> I feel like I've learned more about, I mean, not even, I, I kind of am hoping this phase passes quickly because I feel like this is actually not even such, you know, relevant information for the for the real world. When he was into dinosaurs, at least, you know, they did exist once upon a time. But, you know, my husband bought him this, uh, this book called Dragonology, which is basically a made up encyclopedia of everything having to do with dragons. And he's fascinated wow. by it. Um, so we find ourselves reading these sort of arcane, um, <laughs> wow. um, you know, sort of pages all about uh, um, dragons. Well, we have the nine dragons across Victoria Harbor. 
Uh, and <laughs> yes, in, he would love that. <laughs> Kowloon, and you are in Washington, D.C. Last question. What happened to Maggie Moo's ice cream and where do you go uh, now for your Washington, D.C. <laughs> ice cream fix? <laughs> oh, what a good question. You know, um, I I think I never actually used up that gift card you gave me for my birthday one year for Maggie Moose because they closed. Um, but uh, uh, I got to say, Thomas Sweet in Georgetown, they uh, they catered our wedding. Um, and uh, and that is uh, my favorite place in, in D.C. Well, from FCC in Hong Kong, <laughs> a Fong, Maggie Mooless in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here and explaining everything about RFA. We hope you're there at the mm -hmm. helm for the next 25 years. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, you've already promised you're going to come and visit us in person as soon as travel permits. Uh, so thank you for joining. Thank you for everybody in the uh, Zoom room here, uh, whether you're live from Hong Kong or Washington. And thank you all for joining us if you're watching this later on YouTube. This will be available on our YouTube channel. Subscribe to FCCHK.org. Thank you, Bei Fong. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Great to be here. Bye, everyone. Goodbye.